Jesus, we love you tonight. Tonight, I just feel, guys, we're, we're, we're in it for an encounter tonight. And, and I just feel the presence of God strong in here. And I feel like God is going to meet us. Because when you talk about Jesus and you talk about his kingdom, and you sing about Jesus and you sing about his kingdom, Jesus shows up with his kingdom. Jesus loves to show up with his kingdom. Father God, we ask that your kingdom would come tonight, Father. God, more than words, God, that your kingdom would come tonight, God. Jesus, we invite you to wreck our life again tonight, God, in Jesus' name. We love you so much. Jesus, we say we're hungry. We're hungry. We're hungry. We're hungry. We want to be like the woman who grabbed your robe because we wanted something from you, God. We're not going to wait for you to come to us, God. We're running to you, God, and we're going to grab your robe, Father, because we want you. We're hungry for you, Jesus. We're hungry for you, Jesus. And if that's your prayer tonight, would you say amen? Amen Amen and amen. Wherever you are, we're going to transition. We're going to scoot through announcements, and we're going to get straight into the word tonight, if that's okay with you guys. So if you can, just find your seat wherever you are. Find your chair. Say hello to someone on the way. And we're going to jump right into the word tonight. don't have a seat, there are some seats, I'm sure. Raise your hand if you have an open seat next to you right now. Open, raise your hand if you got an open seat next to you. Go ahead and make your way back to a seat. Thank you. Come on. Go ahead and find your seat. We're going to get started here. Super excited. We're going to do announcements at the end tonight. We're just going to jump straight into the word tonight, if that's okay with you guys. My name's Nick Brown, part of the Circuit Riders, and I want to welcome you to Monday nights. How many of you, this is your first time to a Monday night? Could you wave a hand at me real quick? We want to welcome you to Monday nights. We want to welcome you to Circuit Rider Monday nights. Right now, you are catching us in a series, and the series is called Counterculture. Would you look at your neighbor and say, counterculture? counterculture. Right now we're in week three of, of counterculture. I'm going to give you, shh, let me get your attention. Right now I'm going to give you a quick recap of walk you through the weeks and bring you to where we're going to start tonight because I think it's important we know where we came from so you can kind of know where we're going. The last two weeks, my pops, Brian, has been bringing the heat and the word. It's been amazing. We're studying the book of Matthew right now. and Specifically, we're studying the Sermon on the Mount. And the first week, we got into Jesus. Now, what we learned in the first week was that Jesus is not your average guy, that Jesus is that guy that's willing to be pretty savage and make everybody feel uncomfortable. That Jesus in and himself is this counterculture revolutionary. Yes, he's the Messiah. Yes, he's the Savior. But he didn't just come in some boring religious way. No, he came in a countercultural way. And that in his day, he was confronting the religious ways and the secular ways in his day with a new way, the kingdom way, the Jesus way. And not only was he saying it or writing it in a book in some corner and putting it out on the internet, no, he was declaring it straight to the face of religious leaders and straight to the leaders of the secular world at the time. How many know that Jesus is a wild man? Wow. How many of you been around someone that knows Jesus really well and you're kind of freaked out because you never know exactly what's going to happen around them? <laughs> man, story of my life with the circuit riders. The last week I felt it was important. We skipped ahead. We skipped to the, 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 uh, the Lord's Prayer. My dad called the Disciples Prayer. And we emphasized that in this kingdom that we have a Father. You see, I think it's very important that we realize that God is not putting us into some kind of kingdom with an angry king who's enforcing all of his subjects to obey all of his rules and accept all of his values or they're going to be punished or, and he's going to be mad. 
Those are all the false gods of the time. No, we have a God who is much greater than all those false gods. And he's a father who loves us intimately. And that when we're invited into the kingdom of God, we're invited into a kingdom that has a loving father. And because of Jesus, we're adopted into that family, not striving for his approval, but already accepted. And from his approval, we begin to walk out his kingdom way. Come on. And so tonight we find ourselves in Matthew 5, verse 13. If you've got your Bible, you can pull it open. If you brought your Bible, your phone Bible, would you pull it out for me really quick? It's the passage of the salt and light. Now, i got to be honest with you. When I first got the, given this passage, you know, the passage of the salt and light, now I was kind of excited. But kind of salt and light for me, when everyone would use that phrase, it was kind of always that speech that was supposed to be really impactful, but was kind of underwhelming, if that makes sense. You're in youth group, and youth pastors up there, and I love youth pastors. I kind of was one, I think, once. I preached to young people. I don't know. I guess I'm a youth pastor in some ways. But he goes, you are the salt, and you are the light, and you're just everything that you wants to go. Amen, bro. That's so good. But you have no idea what he's talking about, and you're like, all I know is I see that on a bunch of Christian bumper stickers everywhere. And to make matters worse, in my mind, the people that kind of represented salt and light we're not kind of the people that I particularly wanted to be like. There's nothing wrong with them. They're very genuine. They're just not quite my vibe. And it's kind of the person that just every T-shirt they own is a Christian T-shirt. <laughs> they got Christian jeans, Christian shoes. They got Christian hats. And they don't talk normal. They never talk normal. I have a Christian shirt. I'm, wearing, I'm not knocking Christian clothes. But there's a certain kind of person that don't even talk normal. They kind of talk a little bit religious. They never just say Jesus. They have to use like every name of God in the Bible. This week I was talking to Jesus, Yeshua, Son of Man, Jehovah Rapha. Let me explain to you what I have for you right now. And you're just like, oh my gosh. And they have a super long story. And you're like, what is going on? I'm scared. Why does their hat say everyone's going to hell? And I, the kingdom is here. Return, repent. And I'm just scared out of my mind. You run into the parking lot and there they are. And they're Ford F-150 with 20 bumper stickers and time posters. Right? I'm not knocking that. What I'm saying is that my previous understanding of these things was that salt and light was kind of this Christian mantra. It was kind of like this phrase that you would say, you know, and you never really wanted to use it when you're preaching because it's kind of like, how do you go from there? You know, tonight, guys, I'm commissioning you to be salty in Jesus' name. Reach underneath your chairs, a salt shaker every day. Just shake it and just say, I am salt for you, God, in Jesus' name. But I was a little bit bummed, but I got given the subject, so I started diving into it. And I want you to know that this subject, what Jesus is saying, is revolutionary. I looked at it not very closely before, but as I began to look at it closely, I began that Jesus was not just moving to some kind of obscure little saying, but Jesus was moving from one part of his sermon to the next to continue to explain his counterculture nature and his counterculture kingdom. I'm going to read this really quick if that's okay. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they must see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So before we can totally dive in this, you've got to understand where Jesus just came from. He was just speaking on the Beatitudes. He was going down, this is what my Christian manifesto is. If you want to be a believer, be a believer these are the values of my kingdom, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, the hunger, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and on and on and on and on. He goes, this is our values. If you want to be a part of my kingdom, you want to know what I am like, this is what I'm like. But then he transitions from what we're like, our character, all of a sudden, to who we are, our influence, and our mission. But the thing about this is that the way that he words this, the way that he says this, he doesn't only imply that it's our mission. He's not just talking about our influence, but he's talking about our very identity. See, isn't it crazy that God has worked our mission into our actual identity in him? You ever had the moment like, man, God, I just want to change the world, Jesus. I just feel like there's something inside of me that's meant for greatness, and I'm, I'm supposed to, you know, do something big with my life. If you felt that, that's actually from God. 
That's part of your identity. Every believer, every son and daughter in Jesus is supposed to long for these things because that was why you were created. When the world, right, is saying, man, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. I'm longing for a bigger vision for my life. I'm longing for a purpose. Did you know what? They're not just longing for a trend of their day, but they're longing for the kingdom. They don't have words for it. They don't understand what Jesus' kingdom is like. But what they're longing for is they're longing for the king, and they're longing for the kingdom, and the one who gives you an identity and gives you a purpose that you cannot believe. Before I can go even much further, i, I got to stop at the very beginning. He says, he says this very interesting thing. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And later he goes, you are the light of the world. See, I can't go any further because, you know, it's a kind of an odd thing to say like that. Normally, if I would have been preaching like Jesus, I'd say, you know what? You are becoming the salt of the earth. You are becoming the light of the world. But Jesus says you are. Isn't it funny that a lot of times in Christianity, this is true for me, when I'm thinking about God, it's easy to receive like the vertical identity of who I am in Jesus. I'm forgiven. Amen. That's so good, God. I'm a son. Amen. That's so good, God. You love me tons. Amen. That's so good. You're my father. Amen. So good. But as soon as that identity shifts from just our vertical relationship to our relationship that comes from our vertical relationship to the world, it's like a whole portion of the crowd just kind of glazes over. It's like all of a sudden this unbelief hits them because the claims of Jesus here are pretty wild. In other words, he's saying you carry influence and the scope of the influence that you carry is for the world. And you've got to imagine who he's speaking to. He's speaking to a bunch of normal Jewish people on a hillside in Israel. And he's saying to them, they're the nobodies. He's saying, you are the light of the world. You carry influence for the world. And I think a lot of times, you know, I can believe those things if I can believe like one day. I always, I believe like with a qualifier. Have you ever, my dad always do this to me. It bothered me so much. Uh, and it was so good at the same time. He would, he would come and he would once in a while, it would be always random. He'd walk up to me and he goes, Nick. Do you believe that you're really a loving person? I mean, you're under Holy Spirit lie detector test right now. Do you truly believe that you are loving? And I'd be like, I mean, kind of. And he goes, that's not good enough. You are loving. And he make me declare, I am loving, I am loving. I started saying what my father was saying about me. And something began to shift. See, it's easy to believe our identity with qualifiers on it. It's easy to believe our identity, well, one day I'm going to become, or one day I will be this, or one day I will walk in influence. Because when I tell you that you're going to walk in influence, if you're anything like me, you have 20 excuses that come to your mind. And as Americans, we know all about excuses and all about arguments, and we got all kinds of popular voices who will enforce those arguments. Man, I, I don't got, you know, I don't, Jesus, I mean, I know you're saying, I don't got a platform, I don't got a particular great personality, I got a lot of junk in my life, I failed a lot, I got no experience, I, and really, I don't know uh, how I'm going to get there, God, I, I, do you, I know you're saying these things, I don't even know the first step to take, and yet Jesus doesn't carry saying you are. Yet Jesus is not saying, uh, you know, the, the, joining your qualifier and trying to argue, no, he just persistently stand there saying, you are. You carry influence. And see, I realized I didn't understand my identity. I didn't understand what I carried because I didn't understand the kingdom. See, in truth, a lot of times in Christianity, especially in America, we begin to mix the culture's values with the kingdom values. We say, we say a kingdom value, but we kind of mean in our mind a secular value. Like how many of you believe when you go, man, who's going to change the world? You immediately think of strong people with lots of influence. But... The qualifications that Jesus is talking to us are very different than the qualifications of the world. He's saying, actually, who's qualified to be light, who's qualified to be salt, who's qualified to walk in influence are those who are poor in spirit. In other words, those who have nothing else but God. The only reason their life can make sense is because of God. Oh, interesting. Wait, you're going to use those who basically are dead unless God shows up. All right. Uh, the poor in spirit. Those who mourn. Mourning, when he's talking about in the Beatitudes, mourning, he's not just talking about mourning lost ones. That's a part of it, but bigger than that, it's those who have regrets. It's those who look back on their past and kind of have this sense of sorrow and regret and go, man, why did I do that? Why did I walk in that way? Why did I make those choices? Why did I say that? Why did I do that? I never should have done that. And he's saying, hey, if you have regrets, you're the light of the world. The meek. The gentle and the humble. 
That doesn't make sense to be gentle and humble in the world. If you've ever been in business, you don't make a lot of money if you're gentle and humble. You got to be ready. You got to fight for what's yours. You got to show up to win. Kobe mentality. I'm here. I'm going to take care of business. I'm going to show you up. I got all what it takes. And God's saying, no, not in my kingdom. The true, inf the true influencer walks in gentleness and humility. That when someone comes with strength, they go, oh, man, that's amazing. I love your strength. How can I serve you? Those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness. See, it's not just those who know they need God and feel bad about their past. But it's those who go, you know what, Jesus, I'm not going to live in the past. I want to live for the future, and I desire to be like you. Blessed are, uh, uh, blessed are those, the merciful. Oh, man, the merciful. Man, the world does not give a lot of mercy, does it? Have you ever made a mistake around the world before? They're not very nice. You ever made a mistake around a mean boss? And they just can't wait for you to make a mistake so they can come down on you? Because in truth, there is some insecurity they couldn't wait to take out on you, some frustration with the world. But God's saying, that's not my way. It's those who are merciful. Because you remember who you were. That at one time you too were failing. That one time you too were down. But no, you said, you know what? I'm not going to judge this person. Their failure is blazing for all the world to see. And the easiest thing I can do is give some discernment right now and point out what they're doing wrong. But instead, I'm going to silence that whole part of me. And I'll walk over and give a hand and say, hey, I got a lot of mercy too. Come up here. Let me pick you back up. Blessed are the pure in heart. It's not just talking about sexual purity right here. What it's talking about is purity of motive. What it's talking about is purity in our motive towards one another and our relationship with each other. It's saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to be someone without guile. You know what? I'm going to be someone who doesn't compare myself to everyone, who doesn't compete with my brothers. You know what? I'm going to be one with a pure motive before heaven. You know, the peacemakers, the ones where it's not good enough for them to have a good motive, a good, uh, a good motive but, and have peace in their life, but they can't stop until everyone around them is experiencing the same thing they're experiencing. And lastly, those who are persecuted. So you're telling me that the guys who get made fun of, who are unpopular, who are not usually the cultural trend of the day, who typically are being made fun of on the news, who are typically being made fun of on BuzzFeed, who are typically being made fun of on, right? That you're telling me that they, that I am the light of the world? That I am the salt of the earth. See, the Jesus qualifiers for influences is way different than our qualifiers for influence. And I, and I couldn't go any further tonight besides for telling you we can't get deeper into what our influence looks like if you're not going to give me your full agreement to say, man, this is my influence. What you're about to describe to me is something I'm presently walking in and going to continue to walk in. You know, it's so wild. It's so wild how Jesus works. It's the best. Isn't it fun? How, I mean, if you were to pick a ragtag team who was going to change the world, you, I would, okay, who's got the most social media following? Who's the biggest influences of our day? And what Jesus goes, he goes to a ghetto in Israel and picks 12 guys. <laughs> this is our king. And so tonight, if you're sitting here and you're going, man, I got some junk in my life, but I need God. I got some regrets in my life, but I need God and I want to be like him. I desire mercy. I don't want to be a judgmental person. I want to walk with a pure motive before God, and I want the world to have peace and us to live in peace towards one another. You know what? I don't care if I'm popular. In fact, if I admit it, I'm rather unpopular. Nobody really knows who I am. Then Jesus is talking to you tonight. Can we get a little bit deeper? Is that okay with you? You are the salt of the earth. Right away, I'm exposed tonight. Maybe you're not used to this kind of teaching. I'm just going to go straight into the word because you know what? I could give you a bunch of pump-up speeches, but it doesn't matter. That's not going to transform your heart. It's only the truth that's going to transform your heart. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus immediately is drawing a contrast between the earth and salt. He's saying if you are a believer, you are something distinct. You are something different than the world. Interesting. And I remind you, he's speaking to this kind of context of all these people, but what, he's not just talking to them, he's talking to all of us. You better believe he knew his words were going to be written down, and he's talking to you. And by the way, when he says you in the Greek, that's empath it's, it's emphatically said, meaning you and only you. He's not just talking to our corporate identity as the body of Christ, he's talking to you as an individual. And he's saying, hey what, you know what, you are different from the world. See, both the metaphors of, of salt and light would have been very natural to the Jewish mind. To even the poorest of people, salt and the, and the idea of a lamp later used in this text are both common things that you can find in the house of even the poorest of people in Israel. 
And what he's saying is, is he's actually giving something a very, very deep meaning to both of those things. He's saying, because salt at the time, they had no refrigeration, right? Our refrigerators, buddies, who loves a little refrigeration in your life? Hallelujah. But back then, they had no refrigeration, so how did they store meat? They rubbed salt all over meat. And a good cure of meats would know how to rub salt perfectly over the meat so that it would not decay. So it would not decay, but it would prevent the decay and give it increased life. See, the first role of a Christian is Jesus has sent us to prevent decay in the world. See, Jesus knew that he was coming into a world that was not ruled by him yet. He's bringing his kingdom into the world. His kingdom is taking over, but right now he's living in a world full of sin. And what does sin do? It brings destruction. And see, what he's saying is the first role of a Christian is that when you show up, darkness stops. When you show up, darkness is put on alert all of a sudden. A Christian walks in a room. All of a sudden, depression's on notice. All of a sudden, anger's on notice. All of a sudden, division's on notice. All of a sudden, rebellion's on notice. All of a sudden, pride's on notice. See, when a Christian walks in, they're carrying something called Jesus. They're carrying the Holy Spirit. And when he walks in, all of a sudden, darkness goes, hold up, hold up. We can't move forward anymore. Wow. Someone just walked into the, into the room that's very different than the world. Something very distinct from the world. And it's standing here, and it's holding back darkness. Let me give you an example. Have you ever had a friend who, when they were a part of your life, it, they were just making good decisions? It was like as long as they could be around your life, they were choosing Jesus, they were saying yes to Jesus, they were doing all of these great things. But as soon as you were gone from their life, all of a sudden their life spiraled back out of control, back into chaos, into darkness, and bad decisions. See, there's something about the very presence of a Christian in the world that restrains darkness, even if the world doesn't give their life to Jesus. And so the first identity of the Christian is one who goes and it, it, it allows the world to be held back some evil so that the world can find Jesus. Can I keep going? <laughs> but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? See, what Jesus is saying here is, see, not only would have the, 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 the people at the time known about the preservation quality, but they also would have known about the purity of salt. See, the idea here is, is actually an idea about convictions. The idea here is an idea not about relevancy to culture, but convictions and being distinct from culture. See, this really popular idea right now is that if we can be relevant enough to culture, then we can draw culture to Jesus. And it almost kind of leads to this world. I don't know if you've ever seen this. You kind of like, it's like, you know, I'm a little bit in compromise, just a little tiny bit. And I'm trying to be more into Jesus over here. But if I kind of show a little bit of compromise, people will immediately accept me. And I'll take their acceptance as influence. I'll take their acceptance as influence. And I think I'm having an effect on them. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Uh, that's not how I showed up to the world. No, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't mix with the religious. I didn't mix, I didn't, I didn't placate to the religious to try to get them to come to my cause. I didn't placate to the lost to come over to my cause. No, I stood in the middle ground that it was distinct from the world. See, it's amazing. It's uncomfortable to be distinct, isn't it? Because when you're distinct, that's where rejection could come. When you're distinct, that's when you get noticed. And the truth is, how many of us want to be noticed? You're like, I want to be famous. But in truth, when you start to get noticed, you're like, man, how can I get unnoticed as fast as I can? Have you ever been in the center of attention in a large room all of a sudden? I remember in college. Um, actually, it's post-college. I don't know if you've ever, this happens every single time. If you ever go into a party and you say, I don't drink, what happens right away? Why don't you drink? What are you saying about me? Are you saying it's evil? Paul said you have a glass of wine. Bro, 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 bro. Here's the deal. We're in a fraternity party right now. They're not drinking one glass of wine for their health in here. I know my Bible. Don't be taking things out of context. In fact, actually, the reason why I'm not drinking, bro, is not because I'm judging anyone, but because I know that this very culture is what leads to all their regrets later in life. And because I'm aware of the abusive nature of what happens in these parties, and I can't be a part of the root cause of what causes so much of it to happen. But, bro, I'm not here. The reason I, bro, if I didn't love you, why would I show up? If I wasn't here for you, why would I show up? Interesting, distinct. Not judging, but distinct. 
You ever been around friends? They're all talking junk about somebody, gossiping. La, 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 la. You know, it's so fun to enter into gossip. It, it kind of is. I mean, that's why there's gossip magazines. You know, that's why pe- the culture's addicted to gossip. They love doing it. Humans love doing it. Humans love talking about people's problems. I, I don't know if you've ever done this before. Maybe it's just me. No one. Yeah, we got a guy, someone over here. They're doing a seminar after, this, after the service. Please show up. And you show up, and they're like, they're talking, do, 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 and all of a sudden, you're that guy, and you're like, guys, I can't enter into the conversation. And they're like, are, what, are you, what are you trying to say? Well, I can't enter the conversation because I used to do this way worse than you. Seriously, way worse than you. And, and when I did this, though, I got so resentful and so angry and filled with so much anxiousness that I became a person I didn't even recognize anymore. I don't want to be that person anymore. So I love you guys, but let's talk about the Lakers right now. Oh, someone's getting delivered over there. That's all right. <laughs> Get some coughing going on in Jesus' name. <laughs> in Jesus' name. See, it's interesting. I think sometimes we're afraid to stand by our convictions because we say it's unloving. Because we've had an example of angry people who are looking down on people and judging them and telling them, don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that from some kind of superior position. But when you walk like Jesus and you walk and you do what he did, he was around sinners all the time. Yeah. And he wasn't looking down on them, he was looking up at them. Right. And he was there for their benefit and their love and for their good. Yeah. It's amazing when we stand by our convictions and we don't become like the world to try to woo the world. It's funny how at first it may be a little awkward, but have you also had the moment? I remember it was the end of my freshman year. I had such a stink the whole entire year. My hall was the craziest hall you can imagine. There was a Christian school, but ain't nobody was Christian in there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> And for some reason, God always would put me in these hallways where everyone seemed to be just like in the deep end. You got like two or three guys that are kind of not in the deep end and everyone else. I mean, I remember I came home one time and there was a guy and this guy was a big dude. He was a tough guy. He used to be a football player, toughest guy in the hall. And he is screaming. He is screaming like a little girl. And that's not bad. Little girls scream amazing. But it's weird if an old man, you know, a strong older man is screaming like a little girl. It's just a little uncharacteristic. And he's sprinting up and down the wall. And dudes are chasing him like velociraptors. And he had done so much drugs that he was hallucinating. And he believed his roommates were dinosaurs. <laughs> Literally, he's hiding underneath his bed. And they're going, Rah! and shaking the bed. He's screaming underneath the bed. It was a wild haul. You better believe that the Bible studies were pretty interesting. Typically, nobody showed up. That's why they were interesting. (laughs) But at the end of the year, that guy comes. And he never wanted to hear what I had to say. He kind of thought I was a religious Donald. And I don't know why I said that. Ronald McDonald, maybe. Uh, At the end of the year, I all of a sudden get my entire hall to come to the Bible study. It was a miracle. We had, we had done, the hall had done something so bad that we made our RD cry the whole building. And she came, she was crying, and she threatened that the, you know, whatever the head guy of the school would come and give us a speech. So everyone was scared. The fear of the Lord struck them. my hall. And they all decided to come to my Bible study. And it was a great Bible study. My only really good Bible study the whole year, and the whole hall's in there. And all of a sudden, I go, let's just all have a time of a little honesty and vulnerability, and I want you to talk about where do you think you really are at being a man of God? Where do you think you really are in your relationship with Jesus? It's not a judgment zone. This is a love zone, but I want you to be honest. And everyone's kind of saying stuff. And all of a sudden, that guy who seems so far from the Lord to me, he all of a sudden pipes up and he goes, you know what? I would never say this, but I have respected you, bro, the entire year. Something about your life, you never entered in what we were doing, but secretly in my heart, that's what I wanted to be. And I want to know how I can be like that. It's funny how sometimes what we think is going to change someone is not going to change somebody. It's crazy how when we live the principles of Scripture, it brings real transformation and change. Let's continue on. It's no longer good for anything if it's lost its saltiness, right? It's no longer good for anything. It's had to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. What is he saying here? What he's saying is that when you lose your conviction, right, it's not just a disaster for the world. It's a disaster for you. The out of Christian, when we begin to fudge and we begin to compromise, what usually happens? When we begin the, the journey of compromise, what usually wins, the world or Jesus? I didn't say it. You said the world. That's what I heard. 
And a lot of times it's crazy how when we begin to compromise our values, it leads to our inevitable fall all of a sudden. But when we hold fast what the Bible says and the values and the love of Jesus, it's amazing how we continue to exact change in the world. Let's continue. Now this part, the heat gets even turned up more. It says that you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now this is a crazy statement by Jesus. Because not only does his presence in you hold back evil and sin in the world and darkness, but when he comes in you, he also gives you power to expel it. Jesus did not just come inside of you to just kind of, you know, try to make things a little bit better. No, Jesus came for the light to invade the darkness. And how many of you know that nothing can stop light? That darkness and a fight between light and darkness, light is always going to win. And the crazy thing about this, he says, you are the light of the world. And if you remember in John 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That's a little bit crazy saying you are the light of the world. Well, I'm not Jesus for sure. But he's like, but you're in a new kingdom. You're a different person now. You're not the person you used to be. You said yes to a new leader in your life. You said yes to someone who, was gonna, who you were going to follow and give your whole life to. You've got a new best friend who lives inside of you, who's taking residence in your life and in your mind and in your soul and in your spirit. And my name is Jesus. And so when you show up, even through your weak and frail portrayal of me, my light shines. When people are looking at you and they go, man, there's just something about you. You know what that is? They're seeing Jesus. Bro, if you think there's anything cool about me, it's not me, it's Jesus. Isn't it wild that Jesus tells us to be like him, to be like Jesus? And if he tells us to just try to weakly do it, I mean, I can't tell you, I wish I was meek most of the time and pouring the spirit and mourn and hunger and thirst and merciful and pure in heart and peacemakers and persecuted. But I can't say that I live all these things, but Jesus knew who he was talking to. He knew he wasn't talking to people full of perfection over this text. He was talking to people who were struggling and with all their heart trying to live it out. He's going, still, if you're in my kingdom, you're shining my light. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to the whole house. See, what Jesus is saying before is stand by your convictions and now Jesus is saying don't be silent. That you are the light. You can't just be the light. Don't just put a basket. There's no such thing as secret Christianity. If you ever met like, you know, I'm just kind of more of a secret undercover Christian, you know? I meet them all the time in colleges. I'm like, do any of your friends know you're a Christian? They're like, no, I just kind of pray or walk the halls in the middle of the night. Show, you know, Lord, bless everybody. Amen. I'm back to my room. <laughs> you a secret Christian? No, I, that's not a biblical concept. There's no such thing as a secret Christian. There's no such thing as kind of, I'm, I'm kind of open about my faith. You know, I, I want to be strategic. You know, I don't want to come out and say I'm a Christian because then the world is going to start persecuting me. Oh, hold up. Uh... <laughs> I don't want to say that I'm a Jesus follower and say that I'm about the kingdom because all of a sudden the world's going to start looking down on me all of a sudden. Hold up. Man, it's in that place when you're open, when you're open with who Jesus is that he's shining through your life. That's when his kingdom shows up and that's when real influence happens. You go, you know, what is this light? You know, what is this salt? You know, is it, is it like doing like, you know, good stuff for God? Is it like, you know, going out and loving people and showing mercy, you know? Is it just in my personal life? Am I just supposed to be showing light to my buddy, my neighbor? No, no, no. Jesus is talking about something very holistic. Jesus is not just talking about your personal life. Jesus is not just talking about your community. Jesus is talking about the world. You see, Jesus' light is lighter, is bigger, is brighter than any other thing. In fact, if you remember, light is what brings color, and salt is what brings flavor. You see, Jesus is not just some, like, religious, you know, voice in America. No, no, no. Jesus is the greatest voice in America. And he's saying that when the... When he's saying that people unify around my voice, when you begin to carry my values and say what heaven is saying, it becomes an unstoppable force. Because there's no stopping light. When the church unites and says what heaven is saying, you know who is shouting the loudest against racism in our country right now? Jesus. Do you know who is shouting right now against the oppression of women all around the world the loudest right now? Jesus. Do you know who is shouting against greed? and selfishness, and the abuse culture that's so pervaded in the perversion of our society, it's Jesus. And so when we align with heaven and we go, Jesus, you know what? I want to take part in that light. He goes, guess what you already are? Just open your mouth. Take the basket off and say something, and the world's going to change.
But it's not just that. It's not just cultural transformation. There's always these arguments over cultural transformation, but I want to just present to you this is what I think. I think that we do see cultural transformation as Christians, but it's also we see cultural transformation by the kingdom of God invading hearts. And it's not just that we're speaking and saying, man, we want a better world and we want Jesus' principles to invade all of society and Jesus' principles to invade, you know, my high school and all these different things. We want the presence of God, the kingdom of God to invade the people's lives around us. Because when the kingdom of God invades, he makes a dead man alive all of a sudden. And when they were once blind, now they see. And all of a sudden, they too are joining on the principle. And all of a sudden, when you begin to see mass salvation across the nation, or mass salvation in a high school, or mass salvation in a college, or mass salvation in the nations of the earth, all of a sudden, you begin to see a tipping point of societal transformation. And he's saying the first step is don't give up your convictions and don't be quiet. But God, I don't know what I'm doing. Don't give up your convictions and don't be quiet. If you would release your voice, you're going to bring a change. And the last verse here is very interesting. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that it may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, what's really interesting about the word good, there's two uh, words for good in the Greek. One is agathos, which means good and quality. But that is not, almost tripped up that speaker. That is not That is not the word he's using here. He's using a word called kalos, which means it is something that is not only good, but captivating, beautiful, and attractive. Jesus saying, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your attractive, beautiful, and captivating good works. And they will give give glory to your Father who is in heaven. See, Jesus is not asking us to walk out some religious deal now. i got to go out and i got to live for God in this crazy way. No, Jesus is challenging us to something much greater than all of that. Jesus is asking us to go and love the world and represent Jesus to a world in the way that he represented the world. He's asking us to move out into a culture where we are operating in such a kind of love that the world goes, I don't know what that is, but I want it. I don't know what's wrong up with you, but I want it. He wants us to move in such radical mercy like a Mother Teresa where the whole world stops and just has to look. And goes, man, I'm not Catholic, but there's something about this woman. She's helping all these people in this impoverished area. And there's just something about it. It's moved my heart so much so that the world got together and gave her a prize called the Nobel Peace Prize. And all of a sudden, Jesus is going, my father's getting glory in heaven. You know why? You know why he's getting glory in heaven? It's because when they see her, they're seeing Jesus. And the father's going, oh, man, they see Jesus, and Jesus is a reflection of me and my kingdom. Oh, the glory is so good. Because you know why? It's not a weird narcissistic glory. It's because Jesus' way is above every other way. There is nothing that can stand, no principle, no value system, no political idea, no ideology, no new theory, no latest wax on theology that can stand up against who Jesus is and how he represents himself in scripture. He is the greatest love. There is no greater definition of love. There is no greater definition of hope. There is no greater definition of the values of the kingdom than Jesus. And when you live in that way, the the world stops and looks. How many of you guys watched America's Got Talent? I watched the America's Got Talent. It was amazing. Michael Ketter was singing on there. He was here last week. And Mike, I, Michael sang this song. I have no idea what the song was. And he, he got, then I watched it on YouTube. And Simon Cowell, I don't know if you've watched American Idol or these different things. But he's kind of this real tough judge. He's always saying something wild. And he starts crying. And he's crying so hard. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, it's kind of an embarrassing cry on live television. Like, he's really in it. You ever had an embarrassing cry where it's like, it's hard to talk? And Tyra Banks, being used of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> goes, Simon, Simon, what are you thinking? What are you saying? What, what, come on, talk through your tears. What, what's happening? And he's crying. He's like, I don't know. There's just something about this guy. I, I don't even, I don't even, I'm not even really sure. I, I can't really put words to it. I just, there's something about this guy. Michael Ketter's life is amazing, but I wouldn't say like that was like, you know, in the magazine of the rich and famous, I want Michael's life. Michael works with the most intense hospital situations. Clearly his life is pretty hard. He talks about it in all the videos. They're suffering. They're taking care of. They're adopting all these kids. They're living a wild life, running from here to there, pretty busy, pretty wild. But yet Simon, who has probably had, what do you think, exposure to the coolest, richest, most influential people in all the world, He's not crying about them. He's crying about this guy. 
Because there's something in his way. There's something in his way of doing things that all of a sudden he's like, man, that's what I want for my life. See, I believe this year that Jesus is calling us to be a force of transformation like we cannot believe. And that this year we need to give up the, the argument with God, the unbelief argument that I am not light, that I am not salt in the earth. But Jesus is calling us to walk out this way in the most crazy ways possible. And check this out. It doesn't just lead to societal transformation. How many of that God's kingdom is also a kingdom of power? See, Jesus is not just asking us to go in with words and speeches and doing nice acts, which are all important, mercy, all of it. All of it is absolutely part of the kingdom. But we can't leave out another part of the kingdom, and it's the kingdom of power. Is that when Jesus walks in, not only depression can you give a speech for it to go away, but you get to walk in with the power of God, and you can say, in this moment, you can be set free. Your heart may be broken, you may come from the most painful circumstances, but guess what? Jesus is walking in, and because Jesus is here, you can be set free. I don't care what your sickness is, your disability, Jesus can bring healing to your life. So when you wake up and you realize that that's the light God's talking about, you walk with a little bit different swagger. You walk in the world like, man, I'm proud to be distinct for a minute. I'm walking in my dorm room, and you know the devil's scared. Because as soon as you open your mouth, business is about to get done. You walk into a high school and you grab a microphone. You've never shared your testimony in your life. But it doesn't matter. Jesus is about to show up through you. And you open your mouth and you stagger through your, your testimony and mess up six times. And give a call to salvation. And all of a sudden everybody raises their hand. Why? Because Jesus showed up. See, this, see what Jesus is getting as influence doesn't come from you. Influence doesn't come through me. It comes through Jesus. And Jesus is looking for people saying, you know what? I admit it, God. I can never be the influencer you're making to me to be. Show up in my life. And all of a sudden, you begin to live in this broken way. God, I need you. God, I need you. I don't know how you're going to show up, but I'm going to open my mouth. He begins to show up. God, I need you. God, I need you. He begins to show up. God, I need you. I need you. He begins to show up. Can we all stand together and can the band come forward tonight? Tonight, as I was preparing, I didn't feel that Jesus just wanted to tell us these things, but I felt that Jesus wanted to demonstrate what he was talking about. I, I believe that Jesus is a God of power and that Jesus wants to demonstrate what happens when light shows up. He wants to demonstrate what, when, 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 uh, when salt shows up. He wants to demonstrate when true kingdom influence shows up. It begins to change things. And tonight, I want you to know that I believe that God wants to change things in your life. And there was a couple different kinds of people I felt the Lord was highlighting in my life or highlighting in this room tonight. And the first one is I felt like when you were going to listen to me speak, you were going to realize that there was some unbelief in your life. And God was saying, I want to use you in a much bigger way than you're thinking. Would you say yes to me that you truly are capable? carrying kingdom influence that no longer would you when you look at whatever scenario or whatever mission field you're a part of wherever God's placed you in society that you no longer look at it with intimidation but you would look at it through the lens of who you are through your identity that I am the salt of the earth I am the light of the world because Jesus Christ lives inside of me the second person I felt tonight was that God wanted to mark your life with power that maybe you've been kind of walking out, you know, like you just, you know, loving people and doing the best. But God's saying all of that is right. All of that is good. And that's a part of my kingdom. But there's something more. And it's the power of my kingdom. When you're sharing with a roommate, when you're sharing with a friend, when you're saying something to somebody, it's not just about what you're saying. It's about something, the presence of God in what you're saying. And when you lay hands and pray for them and you pray them through their issue, that all of a sudden there's a supernatural breakthrough and their life is forever changed. This week, and I was at a men's retreat. And at the men's retreat, there's all these older men, and I was kind of intimidated to minister to older guys because I'm like 27. But I got up in the front, and I realized, you know what? It doesn't matter their age. Jesus, you're inside of me. Light's about to show up. And they weren't from, you know, a background familiar necessarily with the gifts of the Spirit. They had just kind of been learning about it. And I remember just saying, you know, if anyone wants prayer, come up here. And all of a sudden, 
this 50 year old guy comes up or something like that he's in his 50s and he comes up and I put my hand on him like Lord what do I have to say to a 50 something year old man I'm 27 and God says maybe you don't have anything but I got something to say to him and I put my hand on him and all of a sudden I begin to prophesy over him I go, your life has come to some kind of breaking point. I don't know what's happening in your life right now, but God is saying that it's time for you to be the coach that you know you are and for your voice to return being a coach. And he begins crying, and the power of God becomes over him all of a sudden. And he starts shaking, and I'm like, man, something powerful is happening right now. After I'm done praying for him with my dad, all of a sudden he comes back and he goes, this is crazy, this insane tragedy just happened in my life. And I'm so desperate for God, it's brought me to a breaking point. I don't know how you knew that. And I used to be a coach. I used to coach football. And I gave it up years ago. And I felt when you said that it was time for me to get my voice back. Man, when the kingdom shows up, when the kingdom shows up, the next guy comes forward, gives us an encouraging speech. We put our hands on and we start praying for him. The power of God suddenly comes down in a moment. And I go, there's a voice bottled up inside of you. And you've been wondering, you're supposed to step out into ministry. And God's saying, now is your time to step out into ministry. And it's not just you, it's your wife too. She carries a Catholic speaking anointing. And I start going on and on. He's sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And he goes, and he comes out of the sobbing. He goes, man, God has been speaking to this. And I've been waiting for a confirmation. And everything you said is true. I've been having this dream in my heart. And now is the time to go for it. It's crazy when the light shows up. It's crazy when the kingdom shows up. So tonight, we're going to get rid of some unbelief and we're going to walk out into our identity. Would you repeat after me? Say, Jesus. Jesus! I am the salt of the earth. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. I carry your kingdom influence. I carry your kingdom influence. I say yes to walking in power. I say yes to walking in power. I say yes to walking in love. I say yes to walking in love. I say yes to walking in radical mercy. I say yes to walking in radical mercy. I say yes to walking like Jesus. I say yes to walking like Jesus. And I throw off everything. That would hinder me. Or hide my light. Or hide my light. I, say, Jesus, I say, Jesus, use me. Use me. Come on. The last thing I feel tonight is very simple. Is I feel like God wants to mark some people tonight. And I feel like God has been stirring a hunger inside of you to be marked, to walk out in a kingdom influence. And you've been knowing, I know I preach a simple sermon, but this is the Bible, guys. We can't go any further. I know this is simple, but you are an influence, and we can't go any further. And you say, God, I'm coming into agreement with heaven over the level of influence that I walk in. And tonight I feel like God is saying, man, it's time for you to come and be marked with the fullness of the influence you've been walking, that you're supposed to walk in. And my Holy Spirit is going to seal this and you're never going to doubt this again. And from this day forward, you're not just going to walk in love and walk in mercy, but you're going to walk in power. And so if that is you and you're saying, Jesus, I don't want to live a life marked by kingdom power. I don't want to just live a life of love. I don't want to just live a life of mercy, but I want to walk in full kingdom power. I want you to come at the count of three to the front of this room. You ready? Wherever you are. Ready? One, two, three. I want you to come here. Wherever you are, get out of your seat. Walk forward. Walk forward. Walk forward. Wherever you are right now. I know we have some circuit rider prayer teams tonight. If you're one of the riders, I want you to get ready to pray. We're going to pray for as many people as we can tonight as we worship tonight. Jesus, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. God, we ask for your presence right now, God, to saturate this room. Holy Spirit, tonight you are issuing kingdom influencers, God, to wherever they go, Father to walk as the light, to walk as the salt, God, to walk as your influence bears. Holy Spirit, tonight I ask that you would come and you would mark them with power, Father, in Jesus' name. Right now, if just can you lift your hands wherever you are, lift your hands, and I just want you to start to pray to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I want you to mark me. Just begin to cry out to heaven. Say, Jesus, mark me right now. Holy Spirit, come. 
mark me right now. Holy Spirit, mark me to walk in power. Holy Spirit, mark me to walk in your kingdom. Holy Spirit, walk me. Mark me, mark me, mark me. Jesus, come 
is teaching us that you and I are in God's kingdom and that Jesus Christ is our king and that all of us get to go out and leave here tonight as salt and light. We are all salt and light. And there's this awesome, awesome moment here that we're all in. Would you wave your hand at me if you know what forms of religion are? Right, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Religion always takes the life out of our lives. And Jesus Christ puts the life back in our life. And so everyone in this room here is filled with Jesus Christ. Does everybody know the Lord in this room? If you don't, someone can lead you to Christ. But what we're dreaming of is that all over Orange County, we could go out and be the light of Jesus Christ. This, we're gonna keep worshiping, but as we go into that, I wanna invite everybody here to the amazing, uh, really a real enormous house party of the recording of Lindy's second album. And I, I'd love this slide if we could go up there. I don't know if we can do that. But this is such an awesome, if you love the worship tonight, this is gonna be ridiculous. Um, it's, is it up there? Is it up there? Okay, so. I, I, I think God's in this, this thing, so that's why I came up. I really love this, and this is going to be on the 25th and 26th. How do we sign up to go? Where's the, is there a slide? It's all over Facebook. It's on my Instagram. It's on an Eventbrite. Okay. Just Google Lindy Live Recording. It's the first thing that comes up. Great. So, th so there's our way, and 
What we're dreaming of is that we could all be there and bring all of our friends to these epic nights and all the details. What time does it start? 7 p.m. Doors open at 6.30. So come at 6.30 and then you can maybe be on the, the video maybe, the back of your head or something like that. Who cares? I don't know. But can you, uh, how many of you guys got a lot out of tonight's message? Okay, I'm going to do something very non-religious. Stop the music for a minute. Nick, come here. Nick, come here, will you, buddy? Somebody raise your hand that got something out of his message. What did you get? What, this is where we're supposed to sing and everything, but just for a minute, if you don't mind. What did you get? Is there a circuit rider that got something? Yell it out. Weak people being able to make transformation. Okay, one more. Jenna. If I follow God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I'm influencing on that. Is there someone else right there? That shirt. Preventing and stopping decay. That whole salt piece right in front here. Did you have your hand up? You're accepted by the world. Say it again. You're accepted by the world a little bit. It doesn't mean you're influencing the world. That was a profound, yeah. profound point. Very, very powerful. Right here. Don't. The, the objective reality that I am the light of the world. The objective reality that I am the light of the world. Yes. You can't compromise your culture and your beliefs. You can't compromise your culture and your beliefs. Somebody in the very back, yell out something. Is that Kenny back there? What'd you get, Kenny? Did you hear some? I love you, bro. Anyone else get anything out? Back in the back, I see you. What? Don't be silent. Don't be silent. It's powerful, man. Stand for your convictions. Don't be condescending and still love people. Okay, last one. There's been a lot of guys. How about some ladies? There it is. Boom. Uh, the thing about on your whole, like just like being Christ-like and like being patient for people to realize that instead of like in his dorm that sing, that freshman year. Instead of losing your patience and like being being quiet, not quiet, but but being patient is what you said. The Nick was patient freshman year was a point that was, and, and then all of a sudden there was a moment of influence. Is there another lady that had something tonight? It's just silly to think that persecution is like not from God because he says you're going to bless it. So when we're persecuted, we should be like celebrating because he's like, I'm going to yeah. bless you. Yes. <laughs> so persecution is bound to happen and it's a blessing. So we should be celebrating it. Yeah. That's amazing. That's a lot of things we got out of a sermon, Nick. Here, here's, here's where I'm at as a pops here in the community is, is I always want to make sure that, that these young guys don't go home feeling like, I wonder if my message landed. Because we want people that in their 20s to be preaching the word. And you guys giving that feedback now is going to give Nick a lot to think about and just to go, okay, I want to keep going in that. Let me just pray for you, Nick. Lord, I just thank you so much. Would you extend a hand? Thank you so much for Nick and just how he's... He just, I was with him all week, and he just gave his life to these men. He gave his life to the Word, and he just bathed himself in the Scriptures. And what turned out tonight was amazing revelation from you, Jesus. And I loved it, Lord, and it was compelling. And I, I want to be salt, and I want to be light. And I am salt, and I am light. And I was transformed by that, and I just blessed this guy. I bless him, Lord, with revelation that is so outlandish this week about you, Jesus, that it would just keep increasing. And it would boil over until signs, miracles, and wonders were coming out. And we ask for that, that Nick Brent would be a lightning rod, yes. a lightning rod of the power, signs, miracles, and wonders. And mark my hands to heal would be literally bursting from his body in Jesus' name. Chloe, Chloe, would you come up here and stand next to me, Chloe? Wonderful Chloe uh, has, this is so profound. That's why we're in OT right now with the glory. And as a father, there's in the community here, I bring up things that 
I feel are relevant for you, and they also are a pattern for you to follow. And I just feel like pe preachers should have a moment where they get love. Th that's a culture shift. They shouldn't have to go home by themselves and wonder all month. Chloe, you had a profound, I know it was a personal experience, but it just shook me, and it's going to shake all of us. And I know there's going to be some tears in this, but I feel like your story is my story, and, and it's worth it for me and for all of us because this is exactly what is, is Billy Graham and all those messages. He would, we've all have these stories. Brian Barcelona has a story like this. Yeah. All of our friends do. Yeah. But take us into what happened. Yeah. So last week, um, our neighbor, we live in this apartment complex, and it's just a crazy complex. And uh, I see this couple. They're our age. They're cute, cool car. And I walk by him a lot, but I felt to say hi to them this time, like, come on, Chloe. So I was like, hey, what's up? We live up there. I go up to my apartment, and he follows me up, knocks on her door, and is like, I've never met all of you guys. And he meets my husband. He meets all of our roommates. And he goes, my name's Christian. Do you guys want to watch the football game later? And uh, we were, like, kind of figuring it out with him. He goes back downstairs. We went to go get him later to come back up, and it didn't work out. And so we were talking about, as a house, we talked about Christian and his girlfriend all week, that uh, my husband Derek was going to go rock climbing with him this, this weekend, and we were going to preach the gospel to him, and we were talking about how ripe he was and the situation he was in. And um, yesterday, uh, it's really sad, him and his girlfriend overdosed in the apartment. And when I heard, I, I heard the, the mom outside screaming before the police came, and I just looked outside and I said, Derek, he was here. He was here last week. We had a moment and we missed it. And I'm not blaming myself and I'm not blaming Derek and God's bigger than us, but I was just like, never again. Never again will someone come to my door and me not be bold and preach the gospel. You know, our generation is doing this kind of stuff, guys. This is going on every day and we hold the answer. I, hold, I held the answer three doors over. So anyway, there's just a boldness coming on our lives, on my house lives. We're, we're going to live differently after this week. Yeah. Yeah, Chloe. Chloe, I just want to us all understand that the point of the story is, is that God is in charge of his salvation. Yeah. And that you, but your heart is matching the heart of God. Yeah. And that, that, the point is that you, we can't screw it up like that and cause people to go to hell, no. we, we, or, or whatever, you know, that, that we believe in a God that is yeah. in charge of everybody's yeah. salvation. But what you were feeling was like the urgency and the opportunities are all around us. Yeah. And here's a situation where, man, how real is it? Yeah. And I know my good friend Christian, who's here, where's he at now? Right who's going to Bible college. And we just worked that out because I called the president of the seminary before the school and he answered the phone because he wants to go to Bible college and be a pastor. And I called him, and he picked up. And I said, I've got a man of God here that needs education, and I need a discount, and I need a red carpet. And he said, send me his name. And so, but this guy's overdosed 10 times, and he's still standing here. Yeah. And we are, we are in a moment here as circuit riders that the gospel, the gospel, I was driving up here, and I said, man, I'm so excited for tonight. God, what is the outcome you're desiring? And I saw all of us going out and being evangelists this week in the most Jesus-like way. And people started getting saved everywhere we went. And it was like a Jesus people start. The music was sounding, but we were going. And we avoided the religious cliff of like, this is so awesome. But we just stepped away from that and stayed on Jesus and presented him. And Chloe, I just thank you for sharing that. That, that altered my life when you said that to me. And I know it altered. How many of you guys know that We've got some salvation out there to preach and teach by our lifestyle. And we have unsaved friends and people are on drugs and people are on alcohol. And we've got the answer in Jesus' name. So all of us here tonight, would we, could we raise our hand if we're ready to be evangelists? Yeah, I see it. And I feel like next week we're going to have a lot more people here. Because it just takes evangelists like all of your hands to begin to bring. I've seen this before where we need to take that barrier down that green barrier down and believe that we can finish it all to that wall with the gospel of Jesus Christ bringing the lost and them encountering the name of Jesus 
Next Monday night is going to be electric in terms of the message, and it's going to draw people to Jesus Christ. I'm so excited for that moment. It's going to, wouldn't it be fun to see 50 hands next week saying, I want Jesus as my personal Savior. And so as, as I'm just so blessed by everybody that showed up tonight and so blessed by our musicians. We broke a record of like seven bands playing at the same time with the same band. And that was so counterintuitive. It felt like Jesus was up to band creation. Thanks for staying late for that. I want to honor my bro Kevin over there who came up from Dallas and, and helped us with the live stream tonight. Uh, such an amazing bearded wonder and, and, and friend. We have a lot of fun together. Um, and thank you for all of you that came and just gave your guts tonight and just worship the Lord. It's making an enormous difference. You are making an enormous difference in your lives. And as you go out, I'm telling you, don't be surprised if someone gets healed this week. Don't give you surprise if, if your prayer that you felt never worked before does the craziest thing imaginable. Don't be surprised if you take over an In-N-Out or at Denny's and everyone's getting saved. Don't be surprised by what God's going to do in your life this week. And we're going to see so much salvation pouring out of these Monday nights. It's going to be incredible, isn't it? And as we're going now, and Lindy has final word tonight, um, I want to show you something that's so awesome that all of you can do now on the way out the door. Nick, would you come back up? Thank you so much. Nick is going to prophesy over one person in this room. And I want to show you how easy it is to prophesy over someone and they get blown up. And I want us to all go out this week and start blowing people up with the love of Jesus Christ and the word of the Lord. So, Nick, is there somebody out there that you want to point to? I just believe it. Just like we're just like in wherever. This uh, bro with the undercut right here. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. That's you, bro. Can you come up here, bro? OK. So this is this is you at Denny's. This is you at Norm's. You don't go there, but you know what I'm saying? I do. But you you go into your cool place. And this guy's there, and you just say, hey, I got something for you. Do, you. do you see how this works? It moves off the stage into where you're going, and you just follow the prompt of the Holy Spirit. I got something for you. What do you got? You don't have anything. It's have just anything. Jesus. Yeah, and right. so that's so relieving. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it is a relief. My word. All right, let's pray. And then we'll all practice in a minute on our neighbor, and we'll get out of here. Here we go. Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord. I don't know what in the world you want me to say, but I do know that you know, have something to say to him, Father, in Jesus' name. That's it. So, Father God, I pray you would speak right now. Bro, what I feel for you, man, is I just see you, uh, like, running, and you're running faster and faster and faster and faster, and I feel like the Lord just saying there's this it's in rapidly increasing passion for Jesus in this last season in your life. And it's like you just want more and more and more and more of God. And I feel like God's beginning to give you a compassion for your friends around you at your school, even specific people on your, on your heart, on your, you know, on your life. And I feel like God is saying, brother, you're a voice. And, and the Lord is saying, brother, you're a voice and that you can bring them to Christ, bro, if you'd open your mouth and share with them. And I feel like a, a few of them are in a tough spot or in a pretty wild moment, may not be open. But I feel like the Lord says keep working on them. And I feel like, bro, they're going to come to know Jesus, dude. The next thing, bro, I feel for you, bro, is I feel like you, you carry his fire, man. And uh, I see you praying for something. You're like, I don't know if anything happened, but the whole time you were praying for someone, someone felt the presence of God. And they didn't know how to explain it. They didn't have words for it. So they're just like, whoa, that was crazy, and, and just kind of walked away. And I felt the Lord says, start laying your hands on people and praying for people, bro, because God is going to move. And lastly, bro, I feel like, bro, God's going to anoint you as a preacher, bro. I don't know. I don't know you, but I feel like God is going to anoint you as a preacher. Um, and I feel like, bro... Uh, do, do you come from a family of ministers at all? Uh, no. No? I feel like, bro, that I just feel like there's this legacy piece is what I keep hearing, bro. Legacy, 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 legacy. And I feel like, bro, as you, God's going to raise up a preacher, bro, it's going to inspire so many other preachers, bro, and it's even going to inspire all your future, bro. And then, Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does that resonate with you? Yeah. Does it make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So we're, let's extend our Wait, hands. We're going to pray did, for him real quick. Did it make sense, the whole thing? Yes, it did. Amen. You're a man of fire? I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Would you extend your hands with me? What's your name, bro? Hayden. Hayden. We're going to pray for Hayden. Lord, I pray for him, God, right now, that you'd fill him yes, God, up with Holy God. Spirit God. fire. In Jesus' name, yeah, touch him, God, preacher, God, with your glory, Lord. Let your power come in Jesus' name. 
Thank you, God. Amen. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. So good. So then we got to practice on our neighbor one time and we'll let everyone go. And then this is our week. Let's go pray for everybody out there. Come on. Pray for one person. Yeah. Practice it. We'll see you next Monday. Don't leave without practicing on somebody. Get somebody to pray for. Get someone to pray for. And we will see you next Monday.